Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining me for this Insights On Demand session. Welcome uh, and thank you for tuning in wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Dr. Robbie Love and I'm a lecturer in English language at Aston University in the UK. And I'm coming to you from Birmingham in the UK. Uh, I hope you're doing well and enjoying the Insights On Demand program um, wherever you are in the world. And uh, in this particular session, I'm looking forward to spending the next 40 minutes with you. I'm going to be considering what we've learned about spoken English from the British National Corpus. Now, you may have seen um, Niall Curry's talk yesterday uh, introducing the role of corpus linguistics in the ELT research and practice context. And so continuing on the corpus linguistics theme, I'm going to focus on spoken language, spoken English, and um, a, a particular data set and the findings from this data set that have been uh, produced over the last several years. What new things have we learned about how spoken English uh, has changed in recent years and how it may be changing currently? So welcome to this session and I hope you find it uh, useful and interesting. So in this talk, um, I'll briefly begin by introducing the Spoken British National Corpus, this big language data set that Cambridge University Press ELT research team produced alongside Lancaster University. And then I'll give you several examples of recent research into spoken British English that has used the spoken British National Corpus. And I'll be selecting just some of um, uh, a large number of studies that have taken place over the last several years since the corpus was made available to researchers. Crucially, I'll then sort of think about the applications of such research to the ELT context. And I'll consider some of the common routes or pathways for corpus research like this into English, in this case, spoken English, the common routes and pathways that this research um, has to find its way into the classroom uh, for English language teachers. So starting then with spoken corpora, as I said, you may have seen uh, the talk yesterday by Dr. Curry introducing corpus linguistics. Um, spoken corpora specifically are collections of transcripts of recorded spoken interactions. And these can vary greatly in size and also in terms of the variety of the speech setting or the, the context in which the recordings were taken. You can have corpora of uh, casual conversations, of TV shows, of films, um, of political uh, speeches or debates. The list is, is almost endless. Um, and so we can uh, transcribe recordings of speech and build a corpus and then analyze the corpus data to get at um, questions, including how do speakers use language, in this case, of course, English, in authentic speech situations. And this, of course, helps us to teach authentic, current, up-to-date spoken English, which is um, always of, uh, of great importance for many reasons. One such spoken corpus as I mentioned in my introduction, is the Spoken British National Corpus. This is actually really two corpora. There was the original British National Corpus that was built uh, in the early 1990s, um, and then a new version of the British National Corpus that was built more recently. And um, both of these corpora contain spoken data uh, of casual conversations between members of the public speaking English, in the UK and um, having two data sets roughly two decades apart allows for using corpus methods, a comparison of the data sets to find out what are the differences between the way people use spoken British English in the 1990s compared to closer to the present day. And so I'm focusing mainly in this talk on the, this new version from the previous decade this was collected, as I mentioned, by Cambridge University Press and Lancaster University in collaboration. 
Um, and I was a member of the, uh, the research team that built this corpus. And I worked on this project um, as my uh, PhD project when I was a, a student uh, at Lancaster University. And we ended up producing um, almost 12 million words of transcribed casual conversation that uh, the, the recordings were, were made between the years 2012 and 2016. And we had over 1200 recordings from people, um, mostly uh, across England, uh, but also from, uh, to a lesser extent from Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And so what we have here is a, a real opportunity, not only to capture um, relatively up-to-date spoken English, considering the, the, the challenges associated with gathering and preparing such data, it's a very um, time-consuming process, but also, um, you know, the opportunity to compare this data to the previous, the original British National Corpus, as I mentioned. And so what can we do? Well, lots of researchers have been working on this data since the spoken BNC, the new version, was released to researchers publicly uh, four years ago uh, in 2017. And so people around the world, uh, various research institutions, and universities have had the opportunity to work on this data. And now there are already hundreds of research uh, articles that have been published discussing various findings uh, associated with uh, present day spoken English and recent changes in spoken English as well. And so now we get on to the big question, you know, what are some of the things, I obviously can't talk about every single thing. I've picked a few examples just to whet your appetite. Um, what, what have we learned from this data? You know, what, what, what do we know now that we didn't for about modern day spoken English and how it's changed, particularly over the last two or three decades? The first of a few um, areas that I've uh, selected for this talk is modality. Now, modality is the way that speakers um, express the uh, stance essentially on a proposition. It might be to do with the likelihood of something happening um, or the ability of someone to do something or the obligation or necessity for something to happen. And uh, in English, we have various ways of expressing modality. Um, the, perhaps the most uh, commonly cited way in English that we have to do so is through um, modal auxiliaries. We might call them the core modals because there are other um, forms that can express modality, but they aren't considered to be part of the uh, grammar system um, as, as much. So you have nine core modals, can, could, may, might, must, shall, should, will, and would. And, you know, these commonly feature in, um, in, in the classroom, um, and they're very, very useful and serve a range of functions. And uh, myself and Niall Curry, who, who I mentioned, who, who gave a talk uh, in this program yesterday, have recently been working on looking at how modality has changed, um, comparing these two versions of the spoken British national corpora. When you put them all together, we find actually that modality as expressed through the core modals at least, has actually decreased uh, significantly between the data that we have from the 1990s and the new spoken British national corpus. But that does not actually mean that all nine members have been decreasing. In fact, three of them could, might, and would have actually increased significantly. And only three others, must, shall, and will have decreased significantly. And it is actually will out of uh, all of these core modals that has decreased um, the most uh, substantially between these two um, data sets. But often uh, it could be said that when we're considering the core modals, we do think of them as, as a set. Uh, these are uh, part of our grammar. We consider them to be um, a set that we could teach. However, we have this issue of the frequency changing. Some of them are going up actually, and some of them are going down but there's also variation in terms of function. There are different types of modality. 
uh, these modals do not all perform the same jobs, if you will, for speakers of English. And so maybe it might be better to actually think about modals in terms of their function, um, or at least in terms of their function as well as, or instead of, just a set of nine grammatical forms. And to give you an example of the sort of thing we found, I mentioned that we can talk about modals in terms of performing different functions. And this relates to their meaning and what they're used to achieve in spoken interaction. Um, and there are two main, there are others, but we consider two main types of modality, epistemic and deontic modality. Epistemic modality, uh, some of the examples I, I mentioned before to do with the, um, the certainty or likelihood of something happening. So we may use, I just said it, <laughs> we may use a form like may to say, oh, it may rain uh, later on, but I'm not sure. This is epistemic modality. Um, incidentally, may is actually uh, very, very infrequent now in the 2010s data. Um, and then we have deontic modality, which deals with things like obligation and necessity. Uh, so if, um, if you tell somebody that you uh, need, uh, you need, you know, there's no need for them to do something um, or they need not do something, then this is an example of deontic modality. And as you can see, epistemic modality is more common uh, in the 90s and it still is in the 2010s, but there seems to have been uh, a widening of that gap and this again is across these core modals. And so there's, we've got more work to do to investigate this in more detail, but there definitely seems to be something in terms of um, shifts in the way that we use at least the core modals in spoken British English to express these uh, different uh, stances that we have on propositions either being true or likely or not true, etc. And the question is therefore asked, is it the case that we are not expressing our needs, for example, as much as we were before, or are we actually simply using other forms to do so? But this is one example of, um, of you know, recent uh, work using the data, uh, looking at a common kind of grammatical set, but there seems to be more to it definitely than, uh, than meets the eye. I want to move on now to a slightly vaguer set um, of uh, forms and functions relating to uh, intensification and evaluation. I'm sure you already know that in spoken interaction, um, we're, there is a heavy involvement, particularly in casual conversation, of intensifying language. We often like to um, use typically adverbs, but also adjectives, to intensify, exaggerate, strengthen the claims we're making in interaction with one another. And there've been some really, really interesting research papers published over the last few years uh, investigating this area. So one of them by um, Karen Eimer looks at um, a, a new, well, a re-emerging, I should say, function of um, the intensifying uh, adverb well um, in combination or in modification of an adjective. And so the title of uh, her paper actually is that's well good, uh, as that's the most common example of this, of this structure. But it also modifies many other adjectives. You might have well funny, well nice, well chuffed, crazy, gutted, happy, bad, cool, upset, and many others. And this is something that is really um, it almost didn't exist at all in the 1990s, uh, British National Corpus, but it's, it's very, very common in the uh, 2010s corpus. So this is a very, very recent and quite uh, quick change, um, uh, the, the emergence of this, this uh, combination and the function of using well um, to, to modify and intensify an adjective, like well good. Now I said it's a new function but actually that's not quite the case because this isn't just looking at the, the BNC um, data, but there is research that can track many, many centuries in the development of uh, the English language that, um, that can sort of trace 
the, the, the functions of um, various words, including intensifying adverbs. And this is actually a case of a recycled uh, intensifier. This occurred a lot in history at various times um, and, and was especially popular back in the uh, 1200s. And um, actually Stratton has uh, managed to track <laughs> the relative popularity or commonality of well um, as uh, a, an, an, an intensifying adverb, modifying an adjective. And, um, you know, going back many, many centuries, as you can see, um, you can trace uh, roughly from the mid 20th century an emergence again, but it's not the case that this is brand new, as you can see with the peaks and the, the lines um, earlier in history, this has, this has been used before, and this is very common. Um, and this is one of the reasons we have to be so careful to continue to track language as it changes, because it is not always what you might call unidirectional. Um, words of or a particular usage of words in this case, because of course, well, the form well can be used to perform a lot of other functions in English. They change uh, not necessarily in one direction. They don't go up forever or down forever. Um, they can, as you see here, fluctuate over time. And um, this is an example currently, well good, for example, is uh, common but it may not be again. And then in another 100, 200, 300 years, who knows, uh, it might come back again. So this is why it's important to keep up with uh, the trends in, in this way. Um, what about uh, other examples? Well, you might have uh, a structure like adjective and then as, and then a noun or a noun phrase. So um, this uh, particular uh, researcher, Emma, um, <laughs> it's called their paper boring as hell to demonstrate, actually, not that the paper is boring, <coughs> but to demonstrate uh, this structure. But you might have awkward as something, boring as something, creepy as something. One of the things you notice with this structure, which again, I'm, I'm mentioning it here because it has increased uh, in usage uh, substantially between the 90s and the 2010s, looking at these, the, the British National Corpora, um, what's interesting about this is, is that unlike uh, well plus an adjective, which I've tried to sort of demonstrate adjectives that are both semantically kind of more positive um, and usually more negative, um, you know, nice versus bad, a very good example of kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. But typically with um, uh, adjective as noun, it's, uh, it's typically uh, negative. It's words like awkward, boring, corrupt, uh, weird, etc., cetera. Um, and this has emerged uh, substantially in, in recent spoken British English. Um, looking at sort of uh, the positive side of things uh, in terms of evaluation, um, uh, Ioannin uh, recently uh, published a study looking at adjectives that positively, typically are used for positive evaluation and was able, again, using the corpora to track um, which positive adjectives had uh, risen the most uh, substantially in the last two or three decades, and those that had fallen. And notably, we see the rise of awesome, uh, which has uh, skyrocketed in frequency in usage over the last two decades, but also cool and amazing. And there are other um, positive uh, adjectives that have fallen in frequency. And so um, they produced uh, these findings. And as you can see, amazing has risen. Awesome has appeared out of nowhere. It's still, you know, there are many other adjectives that are more common, but the fact that it's gone from zero to what it is now is, is very notable. Lovely, as you can see, has almost halved in usage um, between these uh, two uh, data sets. And so again, changes um, in relatively common, you know, these are not really, really rare words. Of course, they're not grammar words, so they're not massively common, but they are, you know, everyday language. This is casual conversation. And you can see really substantial changes. Look at cool, for example, uh, has, has shot up in, in usage as well. So 
um, it's important. It just demonstrates the importance of keeping track of these sorts of changes. What about the level of discourse? It's all you know, fine and well to look at individual lexis or grammatical constructions, but conversation, successful, natural uh, conversation uh, is, is about more than that. There are structures that we can identify. And um, a team of researchers led by Douglas Biber uh, in the United States recently conducted a study on the new spoken British national corpus, trying to um, identify some of the common units of discourse that emerge in the data. And so they took a sample of the transcripts of conversations, quite a large sample, a few million words. And through a lot of painstaking analysis of these conversations, they were able to um, distill their findings down to a set of, um, of discourse types. What are the things that people are doing in casual conversation in spoken British English? Well, they're mostly talking about things relating to the past, the future or, or neutral in time. So past might be anecdotes or memories. The future might be making plans for something that's happening later on, um, figuring things out, working something out together, some kind of task, maybe when people are cooking together or playing a game, for example. Situation dependent commentary, discussing something that's happening in the immediate setting that they're in to do with the organization of the space um, and the participants in the conversation. Um, of course, personal feelings, joking, providing advice and conflict. And Biber and his colleagues note that um, interestingly, the speakers in the, 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 the corpus appear to a large extent to not be inhibited by the fact that they're being recorded. And this might be something that you're thinking about, you know, how, to what extent can we trust the findings when these people are aware they're being recorded, but we really find, you know, arguments between people um, and, and these are the main kind of core um, functions, if you will, or the reasons why or the things that people do when they're having casual conversation. And so to provide you with an example, this is an example uh, from Biber et al's paper of situation dependent commentary. So speaker A says, are you really hot still? Oh, I know my temperature's fine. I'm just, okay, this window's going a bit steamy steamy, you've got to get your own uh, yellow and blue thing down there. And so this is an example of situation dependent commentary. Um, <laughs> nothing uh, of, of great um, uh, substance <laughs> um, or gravitas, uh, but this is, this is real life. This is, this is the sorts of day-to-day uh, -day conversations that people have, and this is what we're capturing in the data. And it's possible to categorize these. And again, you know, in terms of um, thinking about this in a, in a teaching context, it's really important to, to remember that spoken English is not just one kind of whole unit. Within spoken English, even within casual conversation, we're using language in different ways to perform different social tasks. And so we have to try to uh, think about language in a, in a highly context dependent way. And this is what this data helps us to, you know, to do. What about social variation? You know, in this data set, we know the genders and the ages of the speakers, for example. Well, um, another recent publication looked at vocabulary and the most common or most characteristic vocabulary items according to gender groups and also age groups. So what did they find? Now this visualization shows you the blue uh, male uh, lexical uh, units and the red um, are female ones and the yellow is kind of shared. But at the right hand side there, you can see the, the most characteristic words for the males, mate, ain't, in it, game cards, etc., bloke. And then the ones for the females, my God, blah, baby, weekend, gosh, etc. Again, this kind of work allows us to really sort of take into account 
of the contextual variation, in this case, social variation, that naturally occurs within language. It is not the case that all speakers of British English use language in exactly the same way, or any language for that matter, of course. That principle is not specific to English. What about um, uh, age? Now, the authors, you know, acknowledge that um, calling a group old, <laughs> or in fact young, uh, is not perhaps the most uh, appropriate way of, of presenting the data, but let's say older and younger for the sake of argument. Again, the older people are in blue and the younger people are in red. And again, you can see some, some really, you know, some big differences. Words that are, we saw, for example, that lovely has decreased a lot in frequency. Well, typically when a word decreases very quickly in frequency, it's associated with intergenerational variation what I mean by that is that um, as speakers age, they continue to use a certain word, but younger speakers maybe don't use that word. And so the frequency as, as uh, society moves on and people are born and, and people pass away, then the frequencies change and generations change. And lovely being one of the top words for older people is with that in mind, not a surprise whatsoever. And likewise, some of the words like cool that, um, we saw had risen in frequency from very little previously. Again, that is very typical. Younger speakers are the typically the drivers of linguistic change. And so you'd expect to find um, the, the newer words typically more common among younger speakers. Okay, so I've given you a few examples. There are many more and I wish I could talk about it for hours on end but I don't want to bore you. <laughs> so I want to start reflecting now on some of the routes to how do we actually use findings like this from the research uh, in, in a teaching context for English language teaching. Well, I talk about two main routes, there are others. The main routes, I suppose, from the, uh, the Cambridge University Press perspective, of course, is through teaching materials. And so Cambridge, uh, the ELT research team uses the findings that they're, they're always looking at new research and they're conducting a lot of their own research as well. Some of the research that I uh, have done that I mentioned um, is an example of work that I've done in collaboration with them. And so they're always um, reading and conducting research and this directly informs materials. And uh, Niall Curry, myself, and uh, Olivia Goodman, who is a member of the Cambridge University Press ELT research team, we actually tracked from the very first step of conducting research all the way to the publication of textbooks, the process, how does this work? How does the research make its way from looking in the corpus on a computer to writing up the findings to ending up with the editors and um, materials writers, and then finally publishing in the classroom. And we tracked the entire process and, um, and found, you know, looking in this context and, and changes in adverbs, like literally, which of course has uh, rocketed in use uh, over the last few decades, um, tracking that, that process. Another way is a bit more direct in terms of uh, involvement of teachers is uh, something that may be called, uh, you may have heard of known as data-driven learning, where, and there are different ways of, of involving data in the, directly in the learning process. One is to actually present students with uh, a corpus and, and guide them through making searches themselves. This is possible thanks to tools such as BNC Lab, which was developed by um, uh, Batsa Brasina, Dana Gab Gablasova, and colleagues at Lancaster University. And this is designed to allow just this. Um, you can make a search for something, as you can see here, like well good, to give an example from uh, one of the contexts I discuss. You can search both of the spoken British national corpora, the data sets I've been discussing today. You can see real examples in the context that they occurred in the conversation. And you can look at the change. You can see it's much more common in the 2010s and other features as well. And this is a freely available online. It's just in a, in a web browser, no downloading or installing necessary. 
And um, related to this, uh, the same team have produced uh, a, a series of learning materials, um, including uh, ELT learning materials in a project known as Corpus for Schools. And so here's an example of one of their ELT materials relating to pronouns and changes in uh, the function of the pronoun they. And um, it encourages students to actually search for they and, and other words in the, the BNC lab data and do the research themselves as part of the learning process. As I mentioned, there are many other ways for um, corpus uh, materials to find their way into learning. Teachers can do a, you know, a bit of corpus searching themselves in a tool like BNC Lab, and then simply encourage students, if students aren't sort of necessarily gonna use the corpus data themselves, encourage students to think about things. And, you know, for example, um, think of you've heard of phrases like well good, well uh, chuffed, etc., and note down context where you may have come across um, these sorts of uh, structures and uh, vocabulary items that are proving to be rising in frequency. Okay, so I'll wrap things up now with a few conclusions. Um, so I hope I've demonstrated that with the release of the new Spoken British National Corpus, that it has facilitated um, a lot of new research into spoken British English. As I said, there are hundreds of papers and many more to come. Um, I could only discuss a few today, just to give you an example of what the research community in, in uh, language and linguistics has been doing with the data since it was released. But there is so much more to learn um, about the data we have, first of all, but there's also the challenge of the fact that, of course, language is always changing and soon enough, it'll probably be time to make another one and then another one after that, et cetera, in order to keep up. And actually that phrase keeping up is really crucial. It's really important to keep up with change because it's always happening. And as I've demonstrated, some changes happen uh, relatively quickly. Um, others take longer. Clearly the, the, the British English that people were speaking in the 1990s is not unintelligible to speakers from the 2010s. It's not the case that the language completely changes overnight, but for speakers, particularly younger speakers who um, are emerging uh, with uh, newfound English skills um, into a, a world where English is such a widely spoken language, it is important to try to keep up with changes and using spoken corpora is a really, really good way of doing that. I've tried to kind of touch on a couple of ways that corpus research can make its way into the classroom. This has been, you know, a, a, a challenging and um, a, a timely process over several decades for this to happen. But there are many, many ways in which corpus research has already influenced um, teaching and learning and will continue to do so even more. It's becoming easier to do this over time. And I hope through this talk and also other presentations that you see um, relating to the use of corpora uh, in the Insights On Demand program, of which there are several, that, um, that you uh, are inspired to, uh, if you don't already, consider the ways in which you might incorporate this sort of approach in your own practice. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I really hope you've um, en enjoyed this and it's great to see uh, so much interest and so many of you here with me. Um, here are my uh, references. I'll leave this up on the screen for a few moments uh, for those who are interested in um, following up on any of the particular findings that I've mentioned today. Um, I am available now to take uh, any questions for 10 minutes or so uh, for the remainder of this session. So please do, um, uh, if, if you haven't already, type your comments and questions in the chat and we'll have a little discussion about this. Otherwise, thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure to present at Insights on Demand, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you very much.